morning. Good to see everybody out tonight. I am so glad that you are here. This is the most important service you're going to go to yet today. Amen. I want you to know that. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, always wonderful. Whenever you're dealing with God and you're dealing with Scripture, there's always expectation, isn't there? What, well, what can the Lord do? What does the Lord want to do? This is, this is what we are going to do right now. We're going to bow our heads and pray. And as we do that, this is what I want you to ask God to do. What did you bring tonight that you want God to fill? A thimble or a bucket? What, what, what is it? Do you, do you need something from the Lord? Right now, as I pray, you bow and you pray and ask God to do something in your heart and life. All right, let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we come now and give the service into your hands, and we ask, dear God, of all the, the multiplied needs that are here, that, Lord, you would just speak and have your way. I, I pray, dear God, that you would touch down uh, wherever you want to, in the mind, in the body, in the heart. God, you just have your way tonight. We want you to be lifted up, exalted in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me if you would, please. If you're using your hymn books, 411, revive us again. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we are so thankful to be in your house, Lord, tonight, Lord, and we ask that you would do just that in our life as we sing, Lord, revive us again. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be open to the word of God tonight, Lord. I pray that you would speak to every heart in this place, Lord, and, and that we will leave here changed by the word of God. Lord, I pray that you be with our speaker. Give them the strength, give them power from the Holy Spirit. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to go ahead and take up the offering. Just a reminder, if you would please, that everything that comes in tonight goes to our speaker. All right, go ahead, and then we'll have our choir in a moment. Thank you.
Take your books one more time, if you would. 490, take my life and let it be. Stand with me if you would. We are thrilled to have our evangelist with us here for Revival, 
Brother Morris Gleister um, with us. And brother, you don't know this, but I can relate very well to your uh, love for Texas. I married a Texan. And, um, and you said they're very proud. That is actually very true. And um, first two months of our marriage, I quickly found that that's all she talked about was Texas. And uh, we honeymooned in Tennessee. She talked about Texas. We moved to Virginia. She talked about Texas. And about two months in, I said, is all you talk about is Texas? And she said, what else is there to talk about? <laughs> After three years of marriage counseling, I think we finally figured it out. <laughs> so, no, brother, come speak for us, and we're so thrilled to have him. Aren't you glad that he's with us? Amen. So come and speak for us, brother. Thank you. Thank you, much, Thank you. Well, uh, Pastor Luke will probably need some marriage counseling uh, after all that explanation, and uh, he'll be sleeping on the couch tonight. And... Uh, Oh, he's got a tree stand. Okay. Well, there we go. I'm not going to go any further into that, so I'll just let that go. Good. Good for him. He chose wisely. I can just tell you that. I, I, got, I got hit as I walked in the door. I don't mean literally, but I got, I got into conversations all about uh, the color of my tie and, and college football. And then I was asked, now you didn't clarify this morning about what is your favorite uh, football team. You mentioned you were from Dallas, but you didn't go any further than that. And uh, you're leaving us hanging. I need you to take your Bible tonight and, uh, and uh, get ready to get into the scriptures. And uh, Will, uh, I want you to come back tomorrow night for those of you who, who are uh, supporting other teams. And so uh, I will ask you to go quickly with me to the book of First Peter, would you please? First Peter and get chapter number five opened up in front of you, if you would. First Peter and uh, chapter number five. Thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful gospel song. Regardless of how old you were, when you got saved, if you know the Lord tonight, regardless of your, what we call a testimony of, of uh, what the Lord visibly uh, changed in your life, regardless of your age when you came to Christ, regardless of the stage of your life, no matter what your background was, it's a miracle Amen. that we got redeemed. You know, the word redeemed means to be, it, it, it is the idea of being rescued, and it is the literal canceling out of your sin. When you think about this, Jesus didn't just wink and say, I tell you what, you're not that bad of a person, and uh, I'm just going to kind of overlook uh, the sins of you. Now, you keep your act right, and you keep doing right. I'll let you come to heaven. I'll, I'll go ahead and forgive you your sins. You're, you're not as bad as some of the other people that I've saved. No, friends. Redemption is not the Lord just kind of winking at your sin or just ignoring our sin. It's the canceling out of your sin. Total. We, we were translated, as Paul wrote to the church in Colossians. He said, you have been transferred to another location. You have gone from one kingdom to another, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of sin, and he no longer reigns in your life. Yes, amen. You're in a new kingdom, and you have a new king. Now, this old king keeps screaming, doesn't he? He keeps screaming across the, across the field, hey, remember, remember we used to have a good time, come on back. He has no authority in your life anymore. Amen. You have a new authority. You have the Lord Jesus in your life. And I want to tell you, sometimes you've seen somebody maybe walk in on crutches or, or uh, somebody maybe having a cast on their foot. Or let's take a look at this way. Somebody you haven't seen in a long time. Uh, ladies, you may have seen uh, a, a lady, she changes her hairstyle or hair color. Men didn't, don't do that. Uh, but uh, maybe that happens or, or maybe some other situations happen. And we often look at somebody and we go, what happened to you? 
What happened? Hey, what happened? And sometimes it's a good what happened. Other times it's, oh my, are you okay? You hurt? You know, what happened to you? You and I ought to live in such a way that when, the, when people look at us, we can say, oh, I've just been moved. I, I've been changed. I used to be ruled by another master who did not care for my life. He was trying to destroy my life. I have a new master in my life, and that's the Lord Jesus. And it's a miracle that He would save me and save you. And if you sit here tonight and you've never been relocated, you've never been redeemed, rescued, you may be listening online. Where's the cameras, my brother, that I'm supposed to be, uh, those who are watching online? Do we, right there in front of me there? I can see you too. So if you're looking at me, I look at you. If you need help in knowing that you have been rescued, you sit here in this building or you're watching online, let us talk to you. Call the church office. Stop us before you leave tonight. You need to know about this miracle yes. of being reborn. Yes. The old apostle Peter, he, uh, he takes a lot of, takes a lot of uh, uh, grief sometimes from all of us. But Peter was a leader, no question about it. Peter was the kind of guy that literally was looked to in a, in a dynamic way among those 12 disciples. And Jesus gave a lot to his hands and under his control. He was the one who preached on what we call the day of Pentecost. And God opened the door and opened the understanding of so many there in Jerusalem to the good news that, this, that Jesus that you crucified is the Savior of the world. And 3,000 people came to know Christ that day. And you turn a few more pages over in the book of Acts and you turn to Acts chapter 10, you find out that the Lord used Peter to step into the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And miraculously, now look, you and I, we're all Gentiles for them, I would assume. There may be some converted Jew in this room. But Cornelius, Cornelius was that Gentile that called on Peter to come to his home. And Cornelius accepted Christ and others in his household turned to Christ. And Peter said, oh my, this good news, this gospel news is for everyone. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Peter, as the years went by, continued to shepherd, pastor, flocks of the Lord's people. The Lord told him to shepherd God's people. He was a pastor. He was a shepherd. He was in many ways an itinerant uh, shepherd. He was a man who literally was burdened for his flocks and for those elders, those other pastors that he had taught that were under him. And something was going on in the country of Rome and in the city of Rome. Now I'm laying a foundation for what we're about to read. And what was going on was extreme persecution. Don't miss the background. Nero was the Caesar. Now most of you know the name Nero. Automatically your antenna goes up and you go, bad guy. Yeah, that's right. He was not what we'd call a good Caesar. I don't know of anybody that's named their kid Nero. Now, if you, if you're named Nero, you know, you know, so be it. But, you know, um, you may call your dog Nero, but most of the time people don't name their kid Nero. Nero was a, one of those Roman Caesars that was crazy. It really is true. Historians tell us that he played his fiddle. He was caught up with the world of fine arts. He loved performances. He loved, he loved plays. Dramatic plays. He even wrote some and had them performed in the, in the uh, Circus Maximus, the platform that he was personally responsible for getting built. And, and Nero loved building. He loved building buildings and getting buildings built. And he ran out of space in the city of Rome. And so what did he do? He told people to start, he got his, those under his underlings to burn down buildings and much of Rome burnt down, and people lost their homes and lost their businesses. Are you ready for this? And they lost their, their, their idols, their little gods, whatever they were, wooden and otherwise. They were, and that just disturbed these Roman Gentiles as to, my, my God didn't save my, 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 my home. And some people lost their lives. 
and people were furious. Furious with the Roman Empire. Furious with the government. Because the government didn't seem to care for the, for the Roman citizens. And being the typical politician that I suppose most of us are still accustomed to, Nero said, oh no, no, it's not my fault. No, I'm not to blame. Oh yes you are. No, 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 it's not me. And he had to find somebody to blame. So who did he turn to? He says, it's those, it's those followers of that Christ fella, those Christians. He said, let's, let's take it out on those people. And the persecution began to rise. I don't have time to tell you some of the things that they did to those folks. Churches had to start meeting underground. They had to start meeting in secret places because of the persecution. If they found Christians, they would imprison them. They would butcher them. They would take them and, and cause them to be thrown out into the arenas where wild ravaging animals would attack them. And people would sit up in the stands. Can you imagine this? And watch people attacked by wild animals having their bodies dismembered. And then someone had the idea that maybe we should have some night games, maybe when the weather's a little cooler. Well, how do we get lights for the night games? Let's take some more of those Christians and strap them to poles and dip them in oil and pitch and then light them on fire and they can, their bodies burning all over will provide light so we can watch more be horribly mangled and persecuted. To that crowd, Peter became extremely burdened. Well, I guess so. It was in this letter where he said to them, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is trying you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Then he said, but rejoice inasmuch as you get to be a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. He sought to encourage them. And both letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, were written. In fact, at the end of his second letter, which was written two years after, stay with me, this is important, two years after the letter that we're looking at right now, he wrote the second letter, and, and he would soon thereafter die himself. Peter, Peter said to them in that second epistle, he said, these two epistles that I've written to you, I've written them to stir up you by way of remembrance. Can I tell you what he was saying? He was in his own words saying, revive us again. I write these letters to revive you again to truths that you've known before. And we come here to what we call chapter 5 in his first epistle. And he's dealing with something that has often caused a child of God to tap the spiritual brakes and to keep them from going forward with energy and, and with vibrancy and with, with enthusiasm and faithfulness to their God. All this suffering, he was saying there's something that you need to do with it. Look at the beginning of chapter 5. He says, the elders which are among you I exhort. All right, now these are pastors, leaders of the church. He says, who am also an elder. Peter was saying, I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm an elder, and I, I'm writing this, and I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He says, I saw him suffer on the cross. I saw him after he'd been beaten. I saw him. <laughs> and also a, parta a, a partaker of the glory of What's he talking about there? He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration experience. He said, I saw Jesus in His glory. And he says, and that shall be revealed. He was saying, it's going to be, He's going to be revealed as such again. He was saying, hey folks, stay encouraged. I've seen Him in His glory. We're going to see that again. Then he says to those elders, those leaders, those pastors, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. So he says, lead them and feed them. Stay with it. He was encouraging them to faithfulness. 
And then he says in verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage. He was saying, now don't lord over them and start, you know, being a demagogue and start putting out orders over people and acting like you're the, you're the king of the world or ordering the people in the church. He goes, no, no, you're a shepherd. You lovingly lead them and you lovingly feed them and don't lord over them. And then he says in verse 5, likewise ye younger. Now that meant those younger in the Lord as well as young people. A teenager is believe it or not, he's talking to, to you. He says here, you, you who are younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you, all of us, every one of you as God's people, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. And giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober and be vigilant, that is, keep looking all around, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So Peter's warning them, keep your spiritual eyes open. Then he says, but verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. He says, keep resisting the devil, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. To a large degree, Peter is feeling the hurts, the fears, the anxieties, the troubles of his friends. He's feeling, he's feeling that they don't understand what am I supposed to do with all this hardship and with all these struggles. Where is God in all of this, Peter? And he said, as he's writing to them, I understand what you're going through. Now you who are pastors, you just keep feeding the flock. And you who are younger and younger in the Lord, you just keep submitting yourself to their leadership. And he says, and all of you, don't walk around with pride, keep yourself humble. Then he makes that remarkable statement in verse 8. He says, keep your eyes open and be vigilant because the devil's trying to destroy and rip you apart. But then right in the middle of all this instruction, he says, cast all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Several years ago, in the summer months, let me back up. Uh, throughout the, the entire year, Lynn and I travel pretty much all the time together. Occasionally, uh, I have to go maybe jump on a plane and fly somewhere, and, and uh, demands are upon her maybe to stay at the house back in, in our home in Texas and that sort of thing. But for the most part, we're always together until the summer comes along. We're about to approach that time. In the summer, I'm often, uh, I, well, I'm very grateful uh, for the privilege to preach to teenagers all over the country. Uh, I get to preach at various teen camps across the country. But there's, you know, uh, uh, in my driving and in my ministry throughout the rest of the year, I try to arrange my, my meetings in a certain region for the next two or three weeks. I'm going to be in the state of Virginia and then make my way down to Tennessee and so on and so forth. So I try to stay within a region. But in the summer months, because of summer camps, uh, this camp over here wants me to come, and so I'm, I have to get over there, and then the next time I'm over here, I may be in North Carolina one week, and I may be in New Hampshire the next week, I may be in California the next week, and then back in uh, uh, Louisiana the next week. And so as a result, I'm having to do a lot of flying, and, and, and so and, and, and I'm very, very busy at those camps. I love it. I go running around with the teenagers and so forth. A few years ago, Lynn and I decided, you know, it might be a good time for her to just stay at our home 
And when I can, I'll come home over the weekend in between those camps and be able to be there with her. And she can work on a home project and be the housewife uh, that every woman understands a desire to be. And so she works on projects and that sort of thing during those few weeks at the house uh, during the summer months. She called me one morning when I was out at a camp in California. And she said, Morris, we got a problem. I said, what's that? She says, something's wrong with my car. Now, she has a car at the house, doesn't get driven that very, very much, honestly, less, about 3,000 to 5,000 miles a year, hardly ever gets driven. And, uh, and she said, she says, something's wrong with the car. I pulled it out to run up to the paint store to get some paint today. And she said, uh, she said, it's making a horrible sound. I don't know what's wrong with it. I just pulled back in the driveway in the garage and called you. Now, listen, every husband in this room understands that male instinct that wants to help. But we got a problem. Number one, I'm not very mechanical when it comes to fixing cars, all right? Let me, let me back, back that up. I ain't mechanical when it comes to fixing cars, all right? Number two, I'm in California. I'm about 2,000 miles away. I couldn't say, I'll be right there, you know, and I, I'll try to help you out. I said, well, just explain to me what you're hearing. She told me about the screeching sound, the squawking sound that was coming outside around the wheels. And I said, you know something, I think that's probably brake pads. I said, I think I do know what that is. You need brake pads re uh, replaced. I said, maybe all four or just a couple of them. I don't know. But I said, uh, it's, it, it'll be okay. Your brakes are still okay. It just makes a lot of noise. Drive down, uh, down the road, and, and because we're hardly ever at home, I said, there's this main road. I said, there's a mechanic down there. Just go find a mechanic that can fix brakes. And she told me on the phone, she said, I don't think that's a good idea. She said, you weren't here to hear the sound. And she said, what if I break down on the way to the mechanic? And I said, yeah, that's not a good idea. I said, I'm not real sure what, she said, well, what am I going to do? I said, I don't know. And she said, I got it. I've got to run around and this is the only vehicle we've got here. And I said, you're right. I don't, and I finally, I said, you're just going to have to give me a moment to, to think. And I said, let's, let's hang up. I'll call you back in just a few. And so we hung up and immediately I said, now, Lord, what are we, what are we supposed to do? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I can't help her. I don't know a mechanic to just come over to the house. And, and now I have, we have two sons, and they both were in that city where we were living at the time. But one was a, a youth pastor at, at our home church where we attended, and the other son was a businessman working for a, a, a company in town, and they were both extremely busy. And I, and I knew that they, they, couldn't, they couldn't run out there and probably help whatsoever. They didn't know much about uh, cars and repair or anything. Thing, and I thought, well, I don't know what to do. I'm just, I don't even know. And finally, I decided to call my son, who was a businessman. He never answers his phone. Never. I always have to leave a message, and he's at work. He's not going to answer his phone, but I'm just going to call and see if he's got any ideas. Well, I call him, and lo and behold, he answered his phone. I said, hey, kid. I said, look. I said, I explained to him what his mom was dealing with, and I said, I don't know what to do. And I said, I don't know uh, about a mechanic uh, in town that maybe could help us out. I said, do you have any ideas of what we could do? I said, I think it's brake pads. He said, Dad, I got it. I said, oh, okay. What's your idea? He goes, no, no, no. He says, I've got the problem. I'll solve it. I'll take care of it. I said, what do you mean you'll take care of it? He said, Dad, he said, I'm going on break. That's why I answered the phone. He said, I'll take my car over to mom. I'll drive it over to the house right now. She can use my car. I'll drive her car back up here to the shop. He said, I've got three mechanics who work here at the, at the company where I work. He said, on lunch, at lunch break, he said, I'll get one of them to help me. We'll take the wheelbase off and we'll determine uh, which ones need brake pads. And he said, well, I'll go buy the, the, the brake pads. I'll go buy the parts. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're, you're going to buy the parts? Yeah, Dad. I said, who is this? And, I, and wh what did you do with my son? I, 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 I can't believe this. I said, I kind of like this having an adult kid in my, in my home. This is nice. And, uh, and he said, Dad, he said, I'll take care of it. And he said, at the end of the day, I'll drive Mom's car back to the home and I'll get my car. But during the day, she can use my car and do whatever she needs to. Now, again, the man in me, the male in me is still wanting to be a, an active participant 2,000 miles away. I couldn't do anything. It was out of my hands. 
And so I just said, well, okay. I said, but what do you need me to do? What, what can I do to help in all this? He, I'll never forget what he said. He said, I need you to hang up the phone. That's what I need you to do. <laughs> I said, hang up the phone. What, what do you mean? He said, Dad, I can't call Mom and tell her I'm on my way. He said, I can't take care of it. He said, Dad, go do what you do. Just go do what you do. He said, I'll take care of Mom. It's all take, been taken care of. Amen. You gave it to me. I hung up the phone. I waited a few minutes. And I called Lynn and I said, well, did, did Chad call you? Yeah, he called me. I said, how about that? She said, yeah, it's all taken care of. Now with that in mind, would you look at once again that very familiar verse that you don't even almost have to look at? You got it memorized without even thinking about it. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Amen. It's like the Lord is saying, give it to me. I got it. It's in my hands. Now you go on. I want you to, I want you to enjoy the life I've given you. Don't forget the background. Peter was saying to these friends, I know you're hurting. I know you're confused and scared about the future. I know that you don't understand why, how did I get here? I know you don't understand well, what, what's tomorrow going to bring. I know you're concerned, but stop fretting. Stop worrying. Stop being anxious. Cast it on the Lord Amen. because he's never stopped caring for you. Friends, can I tell you something that you all know tonight? It's not hard to find something to worry about. It's just not. We worry about weather. We worry about uh, future. We worry about, about, the, uh, about, uh, about laws being passed. We worry about job security. We worry about our health. We worry about, do I have the things that I need to make my life content? And Satan is screaming constantly. He wants to control the narrative in your thoughts about what it is, uh, what it's like to live on a day-to-day -day basis for Jesus Christ. It's not going to work out that nicely for you. You're going to have some problems. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to suffer. You're going to have issues. And we go through life thinking, I just don't have the things that I really need in life. And we look, we look, at, uh, we look at what somebody else has and we turn on the TV. TV and we watch commercials and we think, oh my, oh, I, I just don't have what really makes a person uh, uh, happy and uh, makes life enjoyable. Oh, I don't have a car that's as nice as that commercial. And, and they see you show some woman with hair stuck to her face and the question is asked, are you going to live with your limp and unmanageable hair the rest of your life? Use our shampoo. It will make your hair full and vibrant and, 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 and glorious and all this stuff and you think oh, I gotta I gotta I gotta have that shampoo and then someone says oh here's the phone of the future this is the phone are you gonna you know your old ugly 5g phone why this is 17g this phone does everything under the sun it will it will brush your teeth it will vacuum the carpet it will drive and wash your car it will do, and occasionally make a phone call this is the phone of the future you look at that uh, that 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 $850 to $1,000 phone in your hand, you go, what a piece of junk. I'm telling you, I don't have a good phone. I got to get the next best, biggest this. And you base so many times your worth in life based upon how much money's in the bank, how smart your kid is in school. You, you base your value upon uh, the niceness of your car, the size of your home. And when something goes wrong, it's like, oh my, is God mad at me? And Peter says, cast all that care upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. So in January of 2018, 2018, just four years ago, after several x-rays, two MRIs, and a bone marrow biopsy the doctor looked at me and he said 
you have multiple myeloma. And our world came to a screeching halt. I didn't even, I didn't even know that term. I didn't, I'd never known anybody with it. And I said, what is that, doctor? I said, is that cancer? He said, yes. He said, it's in your bone marrow, the blood in your bone marrow. I said, what are we going to do? I, I, I travel, I preach, I got churches, I got summer camps, I got, that's my life. What are we going to do? And that very good doctor said, we're going to attack it. We're going to fight it with everything we've got. He said, there'll be radiation, there'll be chemo, and at the end of the journey, we, you will receive a bone marrow, stem cell, bone marrow transplant. That word transplant scared me to the depths of my soul. I said, doctor, is there any other way? He said, this is the way to tackle it. And the phone calls had to be made. Pastor, I can't come. Camp director, I can't come. No, I don't know when I'll be able to preach again. And the treatment that some of you have gone through of radiations and chemo and loved ones and friends like your, your family and other friends that you've known, that was our pathway for the year of 2018. I never expected anything like that to happen. And I had to find some, I had to find some stability for my life. I had to find some things that I could cling to and say, I, 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 this is going to be my anchor. Amen. And I want you to know something. About three different passages, maybe four, God gave me. In fact, throughout the Word of God I found them, but there were three or four verses and passages that the Lord gave me that I anchored myself to. And in my weakest of moments, I said, hang on to this truth. And one of the ones he gave me was 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Can I just break this one verse apart? You say, Morris, why are you bringing this up tonight? Because I promised the Lord that if he'd let me preach again, I'd tell people what he's all about. And I got a sensation tonight, there's some folks in this room, there are probably a whole lot of people in this room tonight, there are some hurts going on in your life that you can't even communicate. You, and you may be more distressed than you have the vocabulary to explain. And you, you may be more troubled than you're letting on. I'm not trying to make you start thinking, you know something, maybe I am. But there's probably some troubles going on that within your home, within your job, within your life physically, whatever the case may be. Can I just give you some truth? Number one, there is what I call the inevitable reality. The inevitable reality. What's that? Well, he says, casting all your care upon him. He says, you're going to have cares. Peter did not say... Some of you may have cares. Others of you just sit there and let me communicate to other people in the church here uh, about their cares. For, for those of you who do not have cares, uh, just kind of give me a little space here. Uh, let me talk to those who are really troubled right now. That's not what Peter was saying. He was saying all of you have known what it is to have a load of care. Some of you are under a heavy care or you're going to have care. But I'm trying to tell you something, Peter says. You're going to have cares. The word care here is the word that means anxiousness. It, the, the word care means, it means to be, be, to be pulled in various directions. It means like the, the churning of waters. Peter understood the churning of waters. He knew what it was like to be on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and to be tossed about. And at times to not even know exactly which direction you were going to be pulled. He's, he, he was saying those are cares. Those are churning, stirring moments. And he says there are going to be times in which you think everything is smooth and then something uh, makes you lose your footing and you... And and you stumble and you fall. And he's saying here, that's what cares are. He's talking about anxieties, worries, fears, 
Hey, do, do any of these words describe you? Troubled. Anxious. Fretful. Depressed. You know, emotions are something that the Lord has given us. Emotions are a wonderful tool to help us in communicating with somebody. We can talk, some of you men will sit around and talk about hunting season, and boy, your eyes begin to sparkle, and, and, and foam begins to gather around the sides of your mouth, and you start talking and spitting on people while you're talking to them. I mean, you, I mean your emotions pick up, or maybe it's a brand new car, or the new trucks that are coming out or something, and you'll start talking about those, or maybe some of you, you start talking about technology, and you're talking about the newest, fastest, best computer and everything that's out there. Or others of you start talking about other, the, some shopping uh, uh, ladies. You talk about something that you've seen in, in shopping or maybe something that uh, a jewelry or, or garage sales. I don't know what may stir you up. I mean, you get excited. Emotions are wonderful tools to, have, to help us in communication. But emotions are not to be in the driver's seat of your life. They're to be sitting in the back seat just as a companion to help us to bring color to our life, to, to bring laughter at times, to make us empathy, to show empathy to someone who's hurting and suffering, to be a person who, who has compassion and passion in their life. Uh, emotions are a wonderful gift from the Lord. They're just not supposed to be the captain of your life. And yet so many times they become the master, the ruler when something goes wrong, oh man, where'd this come from? It came from the one who ordered it, who allowed it to bring teaching into your life for some reason, and maybe to teach you again. Cast that care back on me. I gave it to you, now give it back to me. Let me ask you, when you're going through a hard time, uh, uh, did, did you grow in the Lord the most during that time, or do you grow in the Lord the most when everything is smooth sailing? Now, if you're a growing Christian, I'll tell you, I know the answer. You grow in the Lord a lot more when things are troubled, when there's troublesome, in your, troublesome uh, times in your life. I'm pretty simple in understanding where troubles like this come from. Sometimes they come from our past. Things that happened to us, things that we did in our past that still trouble us. Things that, things that, things that were done to you by somebody else. And they just kind of weigh you down. And you carry it like a, a bag of rocks on your back all the time. And you just kind of always load it down. Um, the home you grew up in, the school you went to, the military uh, uh, branch that you entered into, uh, the, the college that you attended, the job that you first had, the relationships, all those things in the past, and they begin to tax you, and you wait down through life. And sometimes I've talked to people, and I've said to them, and they'll share some burden on their heart with me, and I'll say, oh, my friend, I am so sorry. And I'm thinking that what they're telling, telling me right now is something that just happened a week ago or something. And I'll say to them, by, by the way, when did this happen? And they'll go, uh, well, it's been, it's been 25 years ago. What? But no, wait a minute. I've allowed the hardships and the difficulties of my past sometimes to weight me down. And many a person's gone through life saying, if only I hadn't taken that first drink of alcohol. If only I hadn't hung out with that crowd of people. If only I hadn't gone into the military. If only I had have gone into the military. If only, if only, if only. And you can spend the rest of your life dragging along. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, yes. forgetting those things which are behind Amen. and reaching forth unto those things which are in front of me before, I'm pressing on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't let the past be something that makes you walk around with the cares of life. And keep, who wants your Savior? Who wants to know the, the Lord from you when you're walking around with the weight of the world on your countenance and in your life? If it's not the past, it's the present. There was a woman in, that was a friend of Jesus. Her name was Martha. And Martha was, 
was running around the house trying to prepare a meal and she was so busy and she, you know, I, I, I kind of get that Martha syndrome and I'm telling that type A personality of trying to get everything done and, and frantic about how am I going to get everything done in the time frame and so forth. And what does she do? She comes out <coughs> and she rebukes Jesus. Whoa. You know, what are you doing? And she says, Jesus, would you make my sister Mary get up and help me? I've got so much to do. I've got all these people to feed. I have more to do than I've got time to get done. And sometimes we allow the present problems and the present concerns about today's health and today's finances and today's responsibilities and today's relationships to encumber us and cause us to be walking around with the care of the world in our life. A lady went up to her pastor one time and she said, Pastor, I, you know, you've often said that worrying doesn't work. She said, I, she goes, I think it works. He said, no, ma'am, it doesn't. What do you mean? She goes, yeah. She said, I've discovered most of the things I worry about never happen. And she said, so I guess it must help for me to worry about it. He said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. Now, on a Sunday evening, the Lord's Day seems to bring a little bit of a restful peacefulness. When you get up in the morning, you've got a schedule to keep, and you've got everything in the world hitting you. And you're going to listen to this sermon and say, yeah, I agree with all this. And some of us are going to forget what the Bible's trying to tell us. And sometimes it's the past that makes us be full of care. Sometimes it's the present. And I think you know where I'm going. If it's not the past, if it's not the present, it is the possibilities of the future. I've got to get my outline going here. It's the future. What if? What if I lose my job? Now listen. What if? What if, they, what if the company lose, moves, moves me to another city? I don't want to move. What if? What if the retirement is not enough? Some lady may think, what if my husband passes before I do? What if, what if, uh, what if uh, my kid doesn't pass geometry again? What if, I shouldn't joke about it, that maybe that's true in somebody's life. I don't know. What, what if, what if the dog runs away? What could be worse? What if the cat comes home? I mean, that would be worse. <laughs> cat lovers, please come back tomorrow night, would you please? <laughs> what if, what if they pass that law? What if, what if, uh, what if the Supreme Court doesn't stand up for this cause? What if, what if this politician gets elected? He probably already did. What, what if, what if, and you can eat yourself up yeah. fretting about tomorrow. Yeah. Peter said, it's inevitable. You're going to have cares. It's like getting on a plane. And every once in a while, the pilot, like every time I fly, a pilot will get on the speaker system, and occasionally I can understand him. And he will say, uh, please tighten your seatbelt. We're about to enter into some place of turbulence. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to ring that little bell and ask for the flight attendant to come over and say, would you go ask the pilot a question for me? If he knows that we're about to hit turbulence, can he fly around it or something? You know, could he please avoid it? I don't care if I don't get to my destination till about three days from now. I don't like turbulence. I don't like to bounce around in the air. You know what, you know what Peter is saying to his people? You know what he's saying to you and me? It's inevitable. You're going to have cares. You say, well, Morris, this, this is not very hopeful. Oh, yes, it is. Because number two, not only is there an inevitable reality, number two, there is the instant response. What's that? Well, look at verse 7 again. He says, casting all your care upon him. Casting. That's an interesting word. That word casting, friend, means to throw something hurriedly. It means to throw something with urgency. It's the idea of throwing something with great force and energy 
I don't know if you enjoy baseball. Uh, I was talking with Pastor and his wife uh, this afternoon at lunch, and we were talking about, we saw, we looked up on a TV screen, and we saw a baseball game. We got talking about baseball. I love baseball. I played baseball as a kid growing up. I just love the sport. Uh, and I always played in the infield for the most part. And, I, and no matter where you play on a baseball field, but especially as you're out there playing, whenever, whenever that ball would come to you, you had to quickly cast it away from you. I mean, you had to quickly get over to first base or whatever base you're going to because the runner is going to get there before your, your thrown ball. You understand that. It's the idea of casting something in a quick way. And here's what the Bible is saying. Don't hang on to your difficulty. Don't hang on to your care. The instant, the immediate response to the hardship that you may be suffering with today, tomorrow, in the future tomorrows, whatever it is that you're, whatever you're battling with, don't hang on to it. Immediately cast it away from you and forcefully get it away. That's the picture that he's giving here. Hey, did you ever play with a yo-yo? And you throw it down on the ground, and you hit that, you, you click your wrist like that, and you, you whip your wrist up, and that yo-yo comes rolling back up. You know, you know what the Bible is saying here? He, he's saying, don't, don't live a prayer life where you say, oh, Lord, I'm casting down all my cares upon you. Oh, Lord, I, I don't know what to do about this financial burden. I don't know about this health problem. I don't know about this employment problem. I don't know about this relationship issue. God, I don't know about these uh, problems with my doctor's report. I don't know what to do with this. Now... I'll just pick it all right back up and carry it with me too. He's saying here, stop doing that. Amen. And some of us live with yo-yo prayers. <laughs> here, here it is, Lord. <laughs> now I'll carry it with you. The word cast there means to get it off of you, not to take it back. The same word is used for the time in which those who were rejoicing when Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday they cast their clothes on the ground and palm branches, they cast them down. Why? So that they could worship Him and adore Him and call Him the coming King and the coming Messiah. Hosanna! Hosanna! The Savior has arrived. They cast things down. You know something? When we're carrying all the burdens of life, we can't really praise the Lord like we should because we got too much baggage. Cast it down. God, I don't want to carry this. I'm resting in you. I worship you. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. There were times I'd be sitting upstairs during my battle of cancer here. My sweet companion, my dear wife, constantly caring for me. Her whole world revolved around caring for me. And she'd come upstairs and say, you need anything? You're doing okay. And there was more than one occasion when she'd come up, she'd see me weeping. And she'd say, what's wrong? Are you okay? And I don't know if I ever put it in these words, but maybe I did. I just, there were times in which I had to keep casting. I was fearful. And I'd be saying, oh God, I don't want to carry this. God, I'm giving it to you, and I love you, and I worship you. I don't want to carry this burden. Please take it off of me. Take the fear away. I'm not telling you tonight that it's a one-time cast because it wants to creep back up on you. Morris, I, Morris I, I, I try to ask the Lord to take away my worries, but it just comes right back. Yeah, I know, and cast it again. But it just comes back, cast it again. Amen. Amen. Don't hang on to it. Keep casting all your cares upon Him. It's the immediate response. My son said to me on the phone, Dad, just hang up the phone. I got it. Yeah, but so, yeah, Dad, I can't take care of it if you're still trying to be involved with it. Songwriter said, all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat Leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. It's the immediate response. And then this is the best part. And that's the incredible reason. Why should we cast our cares on him? Here's the incredible, the incredible reason. For he careth 
for you. Don't let that pass you by. Peter is writing to hurting friends, and he says, he cares for you. No, wait a minute. Let's break it apart. I'm not a Greek scholar, but can I tell you some of the words that you got here? When he says, for he careth for you, he is saying this. He is saying, this is happening right now. It's in the present tense. I'm not trying to turn this into a grammar class, but it is important. Present tense. He was saying, this is not something that used to happen. He is, he is not saying, this is something that can happen if everything falls together just right. <laughs> he is saying, friends, it's happening right now. He cares for you right now. Yeah, but I don't feel like, no, then tell your feelings to take a hike because it's in the present tense. He cares right now for you. It's in the active voice. You say, woo, what does that mean? It means it's real. It's not hyperbole. It's not hypothetical. It's real. And it's in <laughs> the indicative mood. You say, you're getting me in the mood with all these words. What are you talking about? It means this. It will always be true. It is, it is present tense. He cares for me right now. Put your name there in the margin. Morris, he cares for you right now. And it's not hyperbole. It's not hypothetical. And it will forever be true. Let me put it in plain English. He's always cared for you, and he always will. And your feelings are not correct. He says, I gave you that care, now give it back to me. But I don't understand. You don't have to understand. But, but can you give me a little more insight? No. Probably not. In many cases, the Lord won't give us insight. And the Lord is saying, am I sovereign or not? You say, oh, what's that word mean? It means he's in charge. He's overseeing it all. But, but wouldn't it be better if, no, what's best God says, is for me to do what I'm doing, teach you what I'm teaching you, and for you to give me time and for you to trust me. I mean this. I thank God I got cancer. Oh, you say, no, no, it's the truth. You say, why? Why? Because I learned things about the Lord I never would have learned. Amen. I learned what it was to spend and to depend upon Him. Friends, I don't know how else but to be as practical, as practical as I can be. I had no salary. My world is on the road by faith. I didn't have strength to get online and find some job that I could do online at home. I didn't have the energy or the wherewithal to do it. I had to rest in Him. It's like somebody getting their house built, and they go to that lot. I've been there. You go to that lot, it's just a mess, a pile of mud and lumber and brick and, and trash from the workers thrown all over the place, and you're saying, what an absolute mess. It looks like a third world country right here. I mean, what in the world? I have my house in mind. They're going to build my house. But you know something? You, you sit back and you go, I'll just give it time. There is a construction manager, an engineer, there's someone who knows what he's doing, who's overseeing all this building. And in time, I'm going to get my house as I know that we designed it to be. It's going to happen. It looks bad now, but it's going to be an attractive house in time. And sometimes I would look at the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. And he'd say, I'm building something. I'm crafting something. Stay out of my way. I care for you. I learned things about the Lord that I never would have learned. I learned things about me I never would have learned. I learned how to trust the Lord like never before. You say, well, are you a perfect guy there? No, no. But I learned how to be established in Him in so many ways. I learned some things that He's doing that I could not have learned any other way. So let me be, let me just turn the corner and finish. Look at me. God knows tonight that you don't know how you're going to pay that bill, whatever it is. He knows. He knows you need money for gas this week. He knows. 
He knows you're a little concerned about your doctor's appointment or the report that you haven't gotten the phone call yet about. He knows. He knows your fear. He knows that you're concerned about uh, your grade in school, young person. He knows. He knows your kids need new shoes. He knows your, knows your house needs a new roof. He knows your car needs new tires. He knows whatever your need is tonight. So don't get mad. Don't get bitter. And don't get impatient. Don't blame other people for the problems in your life. Trust Him. He's never stopped caring. Cast it on Him. He's always cared. And He always will. When I was a little kid... My dad was not home one night. It was just my mom and my sister and I as a little boy, about five. My mom thought she heard somebody, strangely enough, breaking in the house. We had never had anybody break into our house. She thought she heard him breaking in the back door. <coughs> it scared her. There were two small children, no husband. She came running through the front part of the house and got us, and we went to the neighbor's house. We called, she called the police, and the police came to our house. I mean, a five-year-old boy scared me to, to the nth degree. Police went to our house and came back and said, there's nobody in your house, Mrs. Gleiser. We were at the neighbor's. He said, uh, it's clear. You can go home. He said, the back door was unlocked. It might have been that someone was trying to get in. My mother said, we're just going to wait for my husband. He's going to be home in a little bit. And he said, okay. After a bit, just pitch black dark, my dad showed up. Dad came home, and we were waiting for him. We called him over to the neighbors. We were standing in the backyard, and we told him what, what we had experienced. And my dad walked back across the street to our house. I thought, that's the bravest man in the world. He walked inside that house and walked around and looked and came back and got us, and he said, it's good and clear. Let's go home. I'm a scared little five-year-old boy. I grabbed Dad's pant leg, and I'm walking across, and I said, Now, Daddy, did you check every room? He said, I did, son. It's all right. Daddy, did you check all the closets? I mean, I remember asking these questions. Did you check all the closets? He said, I did, son. Every closet. Nobody's in the house. Did you look underneath every bed? I did. I may have even said, did you look inside the, the vents? You know, uh, it could have been a real skinny man. I don't, did, did, did you? He said, son, there's nobody in the house. We got inside the house, and Dad said, all right, let's go to bed. Go to bed? Man, I was scared for my life. No, I'm not going to be sleeping tonight. We'll just sit up in the house, every one of us, prepared for anything that may come our way. Dad said, Go to sleep. Go to sleep. I laid in my room. If I live to be 105, I'll never forget. I laid there and my eyes were just bulged, bugged out of my head. I was looking straight out into the hallway, out of my room. I was thinking if somebody came running in, someone came in to harm me, I'd go screaming and yelling and, and, and cry out for help. I barely blinked. Though I was physically tired, I couldn't go to sleep. What if somebody came in the house? And all of a sudden, somebody boldly walking down the hall. And then the hall light came on. And there standing in my doorway of my room was my dad. He knew he had a scared boy. And he was looking around the house. He couldn't even see the whole house from that corner, but he was looking around to see if everything was all right. He was trying to assure a nervous little five-year-old that everything's fine. He walked back down to his bedroom. After a little bit of time, he came walking back down the hall, he stood right by my door, looked around. I've often wondered I don't recall, but I wonder if he looked in there to see if I was still awake. And I was. He was trying to assure me, everything's fine. I got this. He went back down to their bedroom. The third time Dad came back, <laughs> he had a baseball bat in his hand. 
And I remember having mixed emotions at that point. I almost wish somebody would try to break in right now. Daddy, get them! But I do remember that the next thing I did remember, it was morning. I fell asleep. Daddy's going to stay up. I can rest. And the Lord looks at his people and he says, I want you to represent me. I want you to have hope and confidence in me. And I want the troubled world around you to see the calmness in your life. So when you have a care, understand I'm doing something. Cast it back upon me because I still care for you. I always have and I always will. Rest in me, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Would you bow your head with me, please? Lord, I kept my promise to tell people again tonight that you care for us, your people. This is not pie in the sky hyperbole. This is the reality that we don't need to sit around with worry and anxiousness. Help us, Lord, to walk our day-to-day -day life with a spirit of confidence and assurance that you know exactly what you're doing and we can rest in you. Live our lives without care, without trouble, worry-free. God, help your people tonight. Our heads are bowed. Listen carefully tonight because I want you to know that I know if I said to you, if, if you're worried, or if you struggle with fret, fretfulness and anxiousness, let's, let's come to the front and pray about it tonight. Okay, maybe that's what you need to do. But my guess is most of us, if we were honest, would say, Morris, I do let cares get the best of me from time to time. And Morris, I want to have a good testimony for my Lord. So listen carefully. Here's what I'd like to do. Peter was trying to teach his friends how to live victoriously. Victoriously as a child of God in a world of hardship and suffering. We're going to do something a bit different tonight. I don't know if I'll do this any other time this week, but tonight we're going to do this. I'm going to let you stay seated. Normally we stand. I encourage people to find a place to kneel. And if you need to get on your knees, I beg of you, please do it. But here's what I'm going to do. <coughs> I'm going to ask you right there where you sit to just simply make an altar right there where you're see seated tonight and say, Dear God, I needed this. I heard from you tonight. Lord, I, I'm going to bring my cares or my care to you and I'm going to leave it there as best I know how. I'm going to give it to you right now. And Lord, you, you know something. I'm going to continue to give it back to you. Every time I come, ha I'm haunted with it, a remembrance of it. I'm going to cast it back on you because I know you care for me. You give it to him. You say, Morris, everything is good for me right now. Good. Then you, you're wise enough to know that tomorrow could bring cares. You know that. So you say, Lord, help me to remember this Bible, this vital truth tonight. And then after you pray that prayer, pray this, Lord, give me a personal revival this week. Revive my life for you. Make me more enthusiastic about living for you than ever before. Let me say that again. Make me more enthusiastic to live for you than ever before. Revive my life for your glory. And when you're through praying, now here's, here's an important part. When you're through praying, then just stand up. Just stand up at that point. If the person next to you prays longer than you, don't feel rushed. It's not a contest or, or feel like, you know, you've got to keep praying. If you, it won't take long to pray this prayer. Just stand up. If the person next to you prays briefer than you, don't feel rushed. You stay there and finish your prayer. And then stand up when you see fit. You say, well, I really don't have anything I want to pray about. Then you stand up whenever you want to. Nobody can make you pray. 
I'm just encouraging everybody to participate in this invitation tonight. You tell the Lord the concern of your heart and then say, Lord, I want revival. And then at some given point in time, Pastor, Pastor Luke, whoever's going to be in charge here tonight, they'll come and conclude as they see fit. And you take time with your God. And when you're through praying, just stand up. The music will be playing. Father, finish this service with your divine anointing. Help us to rest in you, knowing that you've got this because you care. We ask it in your wonderful name. As the music begins, would you take time with your Lord? God bless you. I'll not re-preach anything. When you're through praying, just stand up. The pastor can come, conclude as he sees fit.